Okay, hello there. Um, it's our great joy uh, to welcome Misha Glenny, um, brilliant award-winning broadcaster, author, um, former BBC man in the Balkans, and creator of the great BBC production of the year, M Mafia, um, which, uh, in, in which unraveled for us the mystery of 15% of the global economy, which is uh, illicit. And he's a great sort of Sherlock Holmes figure, I think, who's managed to go around the world unpicking criminal networks that most of us might be sort of vaguely aware of but can't even begin to understand. Um, so thank you so much for coming, Misha Glenny. And the first thing I want to ask you, something we're all thinking about, which is the Novichok killings in Salisbury. Um, and I know that some people believe that you were involved because, <laughs> <laughs> because they think that you're Russian because you're called Misha. So perhaps two things, really. Perhaps you'd like to correct the idea that you are, in fact, part of the Russian mafia, which is why you managed to infiltrate well, them so successfully. I and secondly, who do you think did do it? Because we all want to Well, know. I certainly, I, I mean, I can't deny that the Skripal poisoning affair was an extremely convenient, from the point of view of the television series, the timing was absolutely perfect. And, uh, yes, yeah, so, um, so casual accusations were hurled at me that I, was, uh, I had partially engineered this. Um, I, I refute all such suggestions. Um, the interesting thing about the Novichok case is, is that very quickly it got... Uh, it's actually not a McMafia case per se. Very quickly it got sort of um, uh, mixed in to several other murders that have taken place uh, in London or the home counties over the past ten years or so, including the Litvinenko, uh, the Litvinenko murder, uh, including Boris Berezovsky's mysterious death, the uh, Russian oligarch who was Putin's main adversary, uh, adversary as Putin was uh, rising from the prime ministership to the presidency and uh, taking up the mantle of, of Boris Yeltsin, who Boris Berezovsky had also sort of semi-invented. Um, Berezovsky initially didn't think that Putin was going to be a threat to him and that he could he could manipulate him. So those mysterious deaths before the Novichok case were actually all related, uh, directly or indirectly, to the personal rivalry between Putin and Boris Berezovsky. The Novichok case is different because Sergei Skripal was the subject of a spy swap. Now, not many people sort of know the ins and outs of that, but spy swaps are very carefully regulated affairs. Uh, in fact, intelligence agencies, again, it's not a terribly well-known fa fact, have agreements with each other about the rules of the road, about what you can and can't do within the sphere of espionage. And if you do a spy swap, then the spy, in this case, Skripal, who is a former member of the GRU, but also working for, MI, uh, for MI6, and had dobbed in to the British something between three and 400 agents of the GRU. If you're involved in a spy swap, once you get to the country that you've been uh, double agenting for, you're out of the game. No one is going to touch you. That is the agreement, unless you violate that agreement. Now, there's absolutely no question to my mind that the British picked up very early on that um, the GRU or the FSB, but probably the GRU was involved. And that was because immediately after the murder, within the first three days, Theresa May had announced in, in Parliament that it was highly likely that the Russian state was involved in this. Highly likely, she said. Uh, that afternoon, the French government, President Macron, came out and said that he was not convinced that the Russians were necessarily involved in this. Two days later, Macron signed up with Merkel and even an, uh, an extremely reluctant uh, Donald uh, Trump signed up to the expulsion of Russians from embassies in Europe and, and the United States. The British had shown Macron something right. to convince him that, yes, the GRU was, uh, was involved. Now, the question that I don't think has been answered 
is, was Skripal in violation of the terms of the agreement? So there was one report in the New York Times that Skripal, in the year prior to the assassination attempt on him, had visited Estonia and Prague and been in touch with Estonian and Czech intelligence agents. One report in the New York Times. It was not picked up right. anywhere in the British media. If that is the case, if that is the case and I don't know, then the Russians will have interpreted that as Skripal violating his agreements. And then as far as the GRU is concerned, and the GRU hates Skripal because of the number of people who he, who he betrayed, then as far as they were concerned, uh, they would have seen that as right. We're going to go. That we're going to go after him. Whether Putin actively ordered it or not, I don't think either British or U.S. intelligence knows that. Um, so uh, there are many, many unanswered questions right. about this. But it's uh, unquestionable that you know, uh, even if he had violated the agreements, bringing chemical weapons into a foreign country is. Uh, an outrageous and an extremely risky thing to do and suggests to me that there, there is uh, trouble in Denmark, basically, by which I mean there's trouble in the Kremlin, um, and that there is probably a battle going on between the FSB and the GRU and, 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 and things like that. But uh, it's, it's a mystery uh, to a degree, but it's a mystery which hasn't yet been solved and will continue to puzzle us for a few years to come, I suspect. OK, um, but I'm intrigued what you say about Berezovsky, because you were saying this wasn't a Muk Mafia hit, but Berezovsky had those links, but we were sort of meant to believe that that was suicide. Or yeah, I don't think... I do I don't, think I, personally, I think that Berezovsky was, was probably killed. I know he was depressed. I know he had a... A weak heart. I know he had lost, lost a lot of money, and he had lost the court case to uh, uh, Abram uh, Abramovich, uh, Abramovich, and th and that may have contributed to his to his depression and so on. But I, I don't think I met him. I, I think three times, and uh, he didn't strike me as the sort of person who would uh, who would take his own life. Um, I, it, there's just something very fishy about that. Uh, that and Putin absolutely hated Burezovsky. And uh, to be fair, Burezovsky absolutely hated Putin. <laughs> so, uh, so of that <coughs> list that kept appearing, that sort of copyright all newspapers list of 10 yeah. people, were they bumped off by the Russians or weren't they? How many of those do you think were? Oh, I think probably them? most of them were. Oh, OK. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, you know, uh, the, the, the circumstances are so you know, outrageously... Uh, fiction like, you know, for, for Scott Young falling out of a window and landing on, on railings. I mean, you know, really. This, uh, <clears throat> no, I think he was pushed. I don't know how many people saw Neil Ferguson talk earlier, but he was talking about sort of global uh, networks and conspiracy theories. And I feel you, you, you've tapped into a whole other kind of global <laughs> network where, if anything, as that story of Scott Young just illustrates, we tend to underestimate. Uh, conspiracies. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I the the whole. Uh, uh, let me explain how I how I got into this in the in the first yes, place. Yes, please do. And um, and and that may illustrate uh, some of this. So, I was I, I actually believe it or not, in a bizarre way, I was involved in organised crime in the early eighties. Uh, because I belonged to a syndicate that used to smuggle books and dismembered Xerox machines into Eastern Europe to pro-democracy movements there. But that mo meant I had to learn the techniques of smuggling. So I would identify which train carriages were the most vulnerable. They happened to be Romanian state railways because they were so badly made. There were lots of places where you could hide stuff. And uh, then when you got out the other end, you'd go and retrieve it from the loo and hope nobody was uh, watching you. And, it, you know, I was in my early 20s. It was fantastically romantic. The, the, I had real le carré moments of, you know, dropping, uh, dropping bags off in Prague cafes for the contact to pick up and everything. It was uh, terrific fun. And uh, so, um, you know, when 1989 came along, uh, that for me was everything that I'd been that I'd been waiting for the restoration of democratic rights uh, in Eastern Europe, um, which had existed briefly in the interwar period. Um, 
it was it was terrific. But I had also started. Um, uh, by this time, I, I spoke Czech, and I was learning Serb Croat. I was traveling to Yugoslavia at the same time as this, uh, 85, 86, 87. And uh, Milosevic came to power in uh, Serbia in 1987. And straight away, I realized that this was uh, not going to end happily. Um, quite how unhappily, I didn't realize. But even then, what I was seeing both in Yugoslavia, but also in the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, this new hybrid of uh, aspiring business people um, who were, who were uh, replacing very rapidly the planned economy with the free market uh, economy uh, in a country like Russia, which had no judicial system that could cope with, um, uh, with business disputes, for example. And so as the free market emerged very quickly from 1988 onwards in the former Soviet Union, if you were going to, um, if you were going to uh, uh, pr protect yourself, you had to employ um, what sociologists refer to as privatized law enforcement agencies, um, but everyone else knows better as the mob or the mafia. And so the very emergence, the very birth of capitalism in Russia was associated with gangsterism. Uh, and at the time, the state was also collapsing. And I, you were watching this uh, everywhere, you know, social services going down, old people dying because they couldn't get medical services and that sort of that sort of thing. So the state's collapsing, and uh, what they're doing is the state is so broke. Uh, in Bulgaria, for example, in the first two years after 1989, they fired 14,000 police officers, right? Yes. I... So, you know, the last people you want coming onto the labor market when your state is collapsing and your economy is <laughs> collapsing are 14,000 people who's, you know, who are good at surveillance, smuggling, and murder. <laughs> Uh, but that's what happened all over Eastern Europe, and they joined the privatized law enforcement agencies. And, uh, uh, and then finally, the other piece in that puzzle was that in Russia, in the early 1990s, they started privatizing everything very quickly, above mm -hmm. all else, the commodity industries. So yeah, Abramovich, for example, made his fortune by buying oil uh, for a dollar a barrel in Siberia and selling it in Latvia for $30 a barrel to international buyers. Mm. And so you suddenly get these vast profits being made and everyone had to be mobbed up as a consequence because the state couldn't, couldn't protect them. And so suddenly in the space of four or five years, we were in this dystopian world of gangster capitalism and in Yugoslavia, the battles to grab hold of state assets was sufficiently powerful to uh, uh, combined with the history of, um, uh, of ethnic tensions to uh, burst out into, into the flames of, of war. So all of, from 1989, you know, I had suddenly gone from this you know, very young optimistic idealist who was witnessing as the BBC correspondent. I became BBC correspondent at the beginning of 1989. And suddenly, there I was with the biggest foreign story in <laughs> decades. And I was running BBC's radio coverage. It was just like, it was a, it was a dream come true. But everyone, of course, thought that I was a spy for one person or another, <laughs> particularly because my name's Misha. Because of your name, yeah. But in fact, uh, I'm entirely Anglo-Celtic by origin. I have no Russian blood in me whatsoever, which I used to lament a lot when I was young. Now I'm quite relieved, frankly. Um, and, uh, but it's just because my father was a translator of Russian literature, a very eminent translator of uh, Bulgakov and Solzhenitsyn. And uh, he was called Michael, and he named me after him, so he gave me the Russian diminutive. So, uh, I so was that intrigued was it. by his you know, Russian interests and how you were drawn to the same area of the world, but of a Oh, he, he was side. a huge influence on me. It was right. a, a, interesting. Uh, Hanif Qureshi uh, earlier on was asked what was the first story he remembers hearing. The first story that I heard was the tale of, of Baba Yaga, the Russian witch who used to fly about in a pestle <laughs> and mortar. 
and live, uh, live in a hut in the middle of the forest that uh, was built on chicken's legs and with skulls for the torches ar around it. Ooh. You know, I mean, <coughs> they don't go in for half measures, the Russians, Ooh. even when it comes to their, to their fairy tales. They give the Gr brothers' groom a fair run for their money, I think. Yeah. And uh, so... Um, uh, still there, really. So there. So, so Dad <laughs> used to tell us these, these fairy tales, and he used to sing Russian songs to us. And uh, half of the books in our, in our house were in Cyrillic, you know. And so, uh, so uh, we had an idea of Russia as a country, um, which was not as strong as our sense of England and Britain as a country, but certainly quite, quite, quite powerful as, as young children. My sister went on to do... Russian at Sussex and then a doctorate at, at Harvard in Russian studies. Um, I actually never learnt Russian. I learnt Czech instead and then Serba Croat. But uh, he taught me to read Russian, which has been very useful, certainly. But of all the things that happen in that right, you know, crime seems to have the strongest allure for you, which it... You know, well, it, it, it was when... The, it was in Yugoslavia. Right. During the war, crime was part of the furniture. Actually, I mean, you know... It, Everyone working in Yugoslavia, it was, it was axiomatic that there was organised crime behind it. So we didn't actually see it as normal. And then I started, I started thinking, wait a minute, um, all of a sudden, it was always part of the heroin route from Central Asia, even during the communist period. The Bulgarian secret police used to send heroin across Bulgaria into Yugoslavia and then up into Western Europe because the Bulgarian secret police made a lot of money out of this. And uh, it also, they also thought it would undermine the morale of the West with a lot of heroin coming into Europe. So that was an established route. But then cocaine started coming in to Croatia during the war. And then once sanctions were imposed on Serbia, everyone became involved in smuggling material in and out of Yugoslavia. And what I and some other researchers identified was that uh, in the year 2003, in March 2003, the Serbian Prime Minister at the time, who was a very progressive figure, Zoran Đinđić, was assassinated. And uh, the, ma the man who masterminded his assassin was a, was a, um, a special forces operative, under, had been under Milosevic, and was now one of the bosses of Belgrade's biggest organized crime group. And the day of the assassination, he disappeared. He was called Legia. And it emerged later that Legia was being sheltered by a Croat nationalist who had also been a special forces operative, but for the Croatian forces. And he was the boss of Croatia's largest organized crime group. So what were these two nationalists who supposedly hated each other, what were they doing wow. looking after each other? And the, the answer to that lay in the guy's name, Legia, which in serbo croat means legionnaire. And that's because he had served in the French Foreign Legion in the 1980s, as had uh, Petrac, the guy from Croatia. And they, throughout the war, had been using the fog of war to create in Yugoslavia this extraordinary industrial distribution hub of illicit goods and services coming from all over the world, straining to get into their biggest market, the European Union, but which was well on its way to become the largest consumer market uh, in history at the time. And a lot of the EU citizens like to um, snort cocaine, sleep with women who have been trafficked and smoke untaxed cigarettes. And so that was, that was what was going on. And I suddenly realized, wait a minute, there is something huge going on here in the 1990s. Crime is globalizing and using the tools and mechanisms of globalization in a way that uh, not even you know, some of the biggest corporations were, were, were able to do. And I thought, that is a story. Just explain McMafia exactly, because everyone refers to it as globalisation of crime. But in your book, it's actually more detailed than that, isn't it? It's about it's a proper sort of franchise. It, it system, is, and which it, I this, didn't was, this was partly under under Bierozowski's influence. Bierozowski uh, was protected when he was living in Moscow by the Chechen mafia. Now, the Chechen mafia originated, of course, in Chechnya, uh, but their biggest um, sort of their biggest operation was in Moscow, um, the capital, of course. And um, most of them in Moscow were Chechens, but not all of them. Some of them, some of them were Slavs. And then uh, it was um, 
a, a local mafia in Yekaterinburg, which was the place where the, the Romanovs were killed, um, uh, approached the Chechen mafia and uh, asked them if they could use their name, because the Chechen mafia were the most feared mafia uh, because of their always decisive use of violence. <laughs> and uh, the Chechen mafia went away and thought about this. They discussed this with, with Bierozowski at one point. And they came up with a solution. They said, yes, you can use our name, Chechen Mafia, but here's the thing. You have to pay a tribute to us uh, on a monthly basis, and you have to uphold our standards, by which they meant you have to be as violent as we are. And uh, so this became a franchising system. And uh, so I thought McMafia, it's like McDonald's. So, so it's McMafia, a proper same cheeseburger you know, throughout the world. That's right. You yeah. get the same, you can expect the same quality uh, <laughs> of ruthlessness, whether you're in Vladivostok or, or you know, um, Yekaterinburg, Moscow mm. or Petersburg. Although Petersburg, the Chechen Mafia never made it to Petersburg because they had their own guys. So this brilliant word, concept, invention, whatever, ma ma mafia, takes us on neatly to the... Um, TV series, yes. um, this huge hit in which you were very involved. Will you, and I know it was quite a long, drawn-out process because you originally saw it as a documentary. Yes, didn't so you? So I, I, I was fascinated. Kind of, I, I was fascinated by the discussion yesterday with uh, about scriptwriters and taking books to TV, uh, and then some of the things that Hanif was saying this morning were also was also fascinating. He said that, the book was optioned before it was published. It was published in early 2008, if I remember rightly, and it had been optioned before by working title. It then went through about four or five iterations with working title until finally, for a variety of reasons, they gave up on it after about five or six years. <laughs> I didn't care because I never thought this would get anywhere near a television screen or a, or a film because it was a non-fiction book and it was a quite complex, sprawling world that it was... Uh, that it was describing, and it had a lot of foreign names which put people off. So, um, <laughs> uh, so working title gave up, and I thought, whatever. But, you know, I got an option fee renewed a couple of times, and that's better than a poke in the eye. And uh, so, uh, and then, but one of the people who had been given the book by working title to, to work on, uh, Hoss Amini, is uh, a Oscar-nominated screenwriter. He'd only done films before. Extremely gifted guy. And he had a friend, James Watkins, who had uh, directed a couple of movies um, which were very successful at the box office, like The Woman in Black. And they approached me and they said, look, we want to turn this into a television series. Neither of them had done long television series before. And I sat down with them. I also had an offer from the, the US uh, network stars at the time for $50,000 to take everything off the table. I would lose rights to the, to the title. I would lo lose uh, all rights. And they would do with it what they want. And I wouldn't be involved with uh, the final production. And Hoss and James came along and said, look, we can't guarantee you any money at this stage, but we really want to work on this. And we sat down, the three of us, and started talking. And straight away, I mean, apart from having Googled their backgrounds and everything, uh, uh, straight away I knew I was working with two extremely talented, serious, creative people. And I thought, I thought, sod it. I never expected this to be turned into anything. And so if anyone's going to be able to do it, it's these two. And this was possibly, I have made a lot of bad decisions in my life, believe you me. <laughs> but this was the one time where I completely made the right call. And one of the reasons was is, is that they didn't, as I've experienced with one or two other of my books, they didn't sort of push the writer of the original work away. They included me. They wanted me there to ensure authenticity, to discuss ideas. Uh, you know, would that work? Would you have a Russian doing that or not, and that sort of thing. And uh, so I was invited into the writer's room, which, believe you me, is a privileged thing to do. I mean, the writer's room is a sort of holy... Uh, 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 um, it's a sort of very sanctified place where usually anyone who is not a writer or not take, a note-taker is not allowed anywhere near it. So there I was for three weeks with... 
five of the best, best writers that Britain and France, because we had a French writer, Laurence, on it as well, um, have, have produced. And I got this master class in how you write TV drama. It and was Hossam, just fantastic. Hossamini brought some of himself into it, didn't he? The idea of the child who was dropped into the British boarding school. And, he sure did. And Hoss, then chose to be played by James Norton. <laughs> That's right, yes. <laughs> yes. Hoss is a yeah. wonderful, wonderful guy in so many ways. He's not as good looking as James Norton, though. I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying that. Um, but uh, so Hoss came here when he was about 10 uh, from Tehran. He came from a, a well to do Iranian background. And much of that uh, confusion and conflict within James's character, Alex Godman, comes directly from Hoss's experience about what it's like going to you know, a, a public school where you don't speak, uh, initially you don't speak the language very well. You have to assimilate very quickly. You have to deny your, your origins. And then you live with that confusion and conflict um, th basically for the rest of your life. And I think that, that uh, they, got th they got that down very, very well. And there are a lot of Russians living in the United Kingdom who've been through that experience. Incidentally, one of the reasons, this is slightly tangential, but it's an important point. One of the reasons why the FSB has been so successful in the SVR uh, the, Sorry, does Russia. everybody know what they are? Could Sorry, they, FSB just and SVR, so SVR, Foreign Intelligence of the Russians, FSB, Domestic Intelligence, but with a, with a foreign outreach as well. Uh, why they've been so successful um, for very little money at disrupting the political processes in the United Kingdom, in Germany, and uh, above all in the United States, but, but profoundly here as well, I believe, um, uh, through using uh, social media and uh, a little bit of espionage work, working here and there, is, is that young officers in the FSB now, they're not like the old KGB guys. Many of them have been brought up and have studied in places like the United States, the United Kingdom and France. They know how our societies oh, work. They know what our vulnerabilities are and how to target them. And that is one of the reasons why, you know, they have been so very successful, um, above all through the uh, cipher of Donald Trump in the United States, but uh, also, as we know, here in the United Kingdom with, uh, with uh, Brexit. They tried it in France. The French intelligence were on it just like that, although we know that the FSB was giving money to the Front National before it was picked up by French intelligence. Uh, so... Uh, you know, these people are fantastically smart and they understand how we operate and how we... Gosh, so it's more unintended so, you know. consequences of globalisation is that we've let them become better at their... They're better at, they're better at what they do in terms, of, in terms of assessing us now. You know, uh, in the end, on the TV series, did you think it was an accurate portrayal of... That well, well, I mean, there were two layers. Well, no, there were specific stories that came from your yes. book, and then there was the world in yeah. general and the atmosphere. And the so the world and the atmosphere, they did fantastically. I, I'm party pre on this, obviously. Sure. Um, and, uh, uh, but at the beginning of episode two, where you had uh, Ludmilla's story, the woman who mm. was tra trafficked from uh, Moscow to uh, Israel, that is... Uh, largely, I would say about 80-85% of the story mm. that I researched uh, in the book, and it was, a t it was a terrible, terrible story. Interestingly, we got a minority of people on social media, on Twitter, um, saying when that story ran in episode two, uh, you know, yet more gratuitous violence against women, and I felt extremely indignant about that response because this was not True. gratuitous. Yeah. This is going on to this very day. Uh, in Ludmilla's case, in the TV show, she becomes the sidekick to David Strathern's character. But in real life, what happened to Ludmilla was she was taken to a brothel in Tel Aviv, and she was serviced by up to 20 men. She had to service up to 20 men a day, six or seven days a week, she was imprisoned, she was chained when she was in the flat where she stayed, and 
showing that story was not about gratuitous violence. It was bringing home to people some of the terrible things that are going on in this world right now, right here in the United Kingdom, in Israel, in the United States, in Dubai, wherever you look, this is going on. And so I felt it was very important, and I felt that they, they handled it extremely sensitively. So on the whole, the TV series, I thought, did a fantastic job. Money laundering, which is central to all of this and where the United Kingdom has a fundamental culpability in the expansion of organized crime around the world. Money laundering is sadly a witlessly boring subject, I know, because I've had to study it. And unless you're a nerd, you're not going to like money laundering. But Hoss and James came up with a fantastic way of uh, showing it um, as early as episode one. Um, Yes, it was and fantastically done that. You've got yeah. this like, graphic portrayal of these things being moved around the world. And exactly, so how, you move things, how you move things around the world, but done in a very sort of taut two minutes of, of, yes. of television which explains to you exactly what's going on and just how many apparently sophisticated people there are in the financial world who are actually facilitating... Uh, political corruption on a monumental scale and organised criminal activity on a monumental scale as well. Which begs the question, someone said, uh, was it Gambetta, who said this is a very understudied area because most scholars, academics, don't want to look, look into it because the witnesses are uncooperative and they might get shot. So you are, are you know, very drawn to this world. Have you been in... Personal. <laughs> how, how do you cope with the threat? Well, A, how do you get people to talk to you? Yeah, that's the, fir the that's first the question. That's the question I kept looking I, at. I'm you glad you quote, I'm, so I'm very impressed that you quoted <laughs> Diego Gambetta there because oh. <laughs> he, for, for all of us who work in organised crime, Diego um, is the person who revealed what this was he's all about. Uh, with the, <laughs> Yes, he's the capo of uh, mafia researchers. Absolutely fantastic guy, and he yeah. explained about how the, how the Sicilian Mafia emerged in the middle of the 19th century, and that pattern of the privatised law enforcement agency has repeated itself time and again, whether it was in the United States in the, the second half of the 19th century with the robber barons, whether it was with Japan with the Yakuza at the end of the Second so World War. So sort of War. vacuum of law enforcement. Vacuum of law enforcement, money? state in yeah. collapse, and privatised law enforcement agencies come in and determine the rule of law by their standards. And once they're there and once they're making money, they put deep roots down into society. So even if you get a restoration of normality, it's very difficult to rip those roots out. Uh, and that is something from which we're still suffering from the 1990s. But so how did I go about doing this? Well, I was fortunate because... Um, in the Balkans, when I started working, this, uh, working on this book specifically, I was a kind of um, uh, A-list celebrity. It's the only place where I am an A-list celebrity. I'm probably not anymore. And so uh, I actually knew quite a lot of the gangsters through the reporting I'd done in Yugoslavia. And they, I was a known quantity there, and they, they would talk to me. They'd explain how it worked. And... Uh, all of them who started talking then, for example, in Bulgaria, there was a, a particularly thuggish gangster who I was talking to, but he was, he was smart. Uh, uh, but he, came slight, he became slightly exercised at, at one point where he said, look, you can go on about us being involved in organised crime and things like that, but without us, the mafia, nothing would have moved in this country after 1989. There wouldn't have been food on people's table because we were the economy. And he had, a, he had a point, you know. Um, the fact that they were, you know, also Gosh. killing people at the time. So they wanted to justify themselves oh, to you. Oh, that, or you, go, you can, you can, you can, I you mean, can go and talk to the Yakuza, right? any leading member of the Yakuza in Japan now, and they will explain to you, we are the people in whom people trust oh, because the, the, the legal system in Japan is so complicated and long and drawn out that if you have a car accident in Japan, you do not go to your insurance company. You go to the lo local Yakuza, and they will send a representative along. They will do an investigation on the spot, and they'll say, right, you pay him 300,000 yen, matter over. And everyone buys into that system. 
And when you have things like Fukushima or, or, the, um, or the earthquake in uh, Kyoto, the first responders are always the Yakuza. They come with food, they come with water, they get people out of the rubble and that sort of thing, and they advertise themselves as they're doing it. I see. So like everyone else in this world, they think they've got right on their side. They, cer they certainly do. Some of them, you know, if you're in big you know, Mexican drug cartel and stuff like that, they advertise themselves as being protectors of the communities, but they are, of course, just mass murderers. That's, 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 really, what, that's really what they are. Um, so, when I, so when I went to see people outside of the Balkans, uh, it would usually take me months in advance to set the thing up. I would go through interlocutors. Um, for example, there was a, a, a guy in Bogota in Colombia who had worked with the FARC on a couple of projects, and he set me up and fixed up a meeting with the, the FARC just outside of Cali in Colombia. And... Um, there I, was, there I was scared, but I was with him all the time. And uh, so he was a certain, a certain protection because I'd you know, run the rule over him as well. And he had a, a solid track record with other, with other journalists. And we had to do this you know, very sort of nerve-wracking thing of getting to a cafe and then he'd get a text. And we moved off to another cafe and then we drove out of town and, uh, you know, past the places where the Cali cartel had built their huge mansions and things like that. It was, it was, all, it was all very nerve-wracking, and you would go in there, and you would have the interview. Because I was writing a book, I was seen as much less of a threat than a, a you know, journalist with a, right. with a camera or, or anything like that. But I would go in there, I would be tense, and I would ask them about their childhood. I would, the, my technique is always the same. Where were, you, where were you born? What did your parents do? What was school like? I would spend hours never with them. Never fails. Yeah. And it has, it, has, it has never failed. Because by the time you know, they're talking about you know, the first time they were dating someone or something like that, they are doing what all human beings, when given the opportunity, love to do, which is talk about themselves. And so there was a smooth transition from their childhood to how they got into the business. And they all had a reason, and they were all you know, understandable and good reasons, whether the family had always been there or they'd been, you know, uh, you have the war on drugs um, uh, and you can make huge sums of money out of cocaine and the state doesn't have the capacity to monitor that. Go into drugs, there's nothing else to do in the Colombian jungle. Yes, interesting you mentioned family there because in any mafia story, there's sort of two. There's this sort of the global network, the business idea, and then there's this sort of family idea, which comes across in the TV program very strongly. Of course, there's a reason. This sort of sub kind of morality thing where you loyalty combined with yes. Uh, but what was happening with the globalization is that those family ties were getting less important, and more important right. were the transactional ties particularly as you were going cross-border. Interestingly, it was the Sopranos which really caught this the, the best. Um, uh, I, I mean, is that absolutely... In what way? Uh, uh, when, when Tony Soprano, if you haven't all seen the X number of box sets, um, then I'm afraid there's going to be a spoiler here. <laughs> Tony Soprano is in the car and has an accident in the car with Christopher Moltisanto, who's his, uh, who's his nephew and who is the man who's going to take over the Soprano organization when, when Tony, uh, Tony goes. And Christopher um, has, because of his drug habit and his bad managerial skills, has become a liability to Tony, who loves him like a son. And Tony realizes that the family and family ties are getting in the way of business, and Christopher has to go. And Tony Soprano kills his own son. It's his nephew, but de facto his son. And that is uh, emblematic for me of the rise of transactional mafias right. as opposed to tightly based family mafias. Mafia still play, uh, family still plays an important part, but more important than that is who can get from who can get the cigarettes from the port of Bar to Bari the quickest and uh, turn over the maximum profit. Mm -hmm. Okay, gosh. Um, 
So I, I feel that I, one of the things I was reading is that only now we tackling London grads. So we have these great sort of, your book goes to Colombia, South Africa, Dubai, Bulgaria, ever, everywhere. But you also start with this sort of harrowing story from the 90s of the BBC. Uh, yes, Alison Ponting. Alison Ponting uh, is, uh, oh God, it was absolutely extraordinary. This was the daughter of somebody who taught me at university. Uh, rather bizarrely, I studied drama at university. And um, uh, Dave Ponting was one of the lecturers there. And um, uh, his, his daughter was killed. By, she, became in, uh, she became involved in uh, a, a group of Chechen mafia people inside London. She married an Armenian who was doing sort of fixing and jobs for, uh, for the Chechen for the Chechen Mafia, Dudayev, if you remember him, uh, General Dudayev's people. And uh, they, uh, they fell foul, the, uh, uh, the husband fell foul of them, and uh, uh, they, the Mafia had thought he'd stolen some money, and so they sent out a couple of guys from Chechnya to kill um, him, uh, they killed him and they uh, chopped him up and put him in a fridge and then they went after who they thought was their wife, his wife, but actually it was her sister and she was living in Woking and uh, a pizza deliverer came to the door one day in Woking, opened the door and uh, uh, Alison's sister opened the door and she was, she was shot in the face and killed and that was it. So this was Woking in Surrey, oh. suddenly... McMafia comes to Woking, and I interviewed the police officer who, was, who investigated that, uh, that crime. It completely broke the, fa the Ponting family, it completely broke them. And your old tutor from university is in witness protection in the He's States. He's in witness because protection because to, this, to this day. I, I sent a letter to him via somebody who I knew was in touch with him, but I didn't, I, I didn't hear from him. I, but the person who was in touch, who's now also since died, sadly, another lecturer at Bristol, um, uh, told me that he was he was traumatized beyond communication by the whole by the whole incident. It was Which terrible. Which begs the question: What should governments um, be doing? Because one of the things you explain very well in your book is how lots of these this fertile breeding ground for mafia is as much created by governments as stopped by them. Well, the, the book was published in two thousand and eight. Yeah. It's ten years later, and we yeah, now so have the t two of the most powerful political offices, including the most powerful political office in the world, uh, tainted by their association with uh, organised crime. Um, for people who who are not convinced yet that uh, that uh, uh, President Trump. Um, uh, has links with organized crime, witting or unwitting, they should read Craig uh, Unger's uh, most recent book, House of Putin, House of Trump, because he, using pretty much the same sources as I did, has, uh, had the, uh, uh, has very intelligently laid out how the FSB and Russian organized crime have penetrated parts of the, uh, uh, of the Trump uh, empire, Trump speaks like a, a mobster. When Michael Cohen, uh, his lawyer, had his offices raided um, uh, about three months ago, or whenever it was, maybe it was a bit longer than that, but one of my main contacts in, in Washington got into contact with me and he said, watch this very carefully because they only raid lawyers' offices for two reasons. One is extreme malfeasance, the other is if they have ties to the mob. And uh, I think uh, <clears throat> uh, there's a lot still to come out of the, the Mueller investigation. So the, the, the problem is, you know, we see, we see the biggest corruption scandal anywhere in history in Brazil. We see a massive corruption scandal in Malaysia. We see people with links to the Erdogan family involved in the smuggling of oil from Mosul when it was under the control of, of ISIS. We see multiple accusations of corruption against the former president of South Africa, Jacob, Jacob Zuma. This is a systemic problem. 
and London's role in terms of the money laundering, people able to wash their money through, the, through London uh, property, for example. There are, in Westminster alone, Westminster alone, there are 10,000 properties owned by anonymous companies registered in places like the Cayman Islands and the British Virgin Islands. That is 10,000 properties who the British government doesn't know who they belong to. So when I hear this government bleat on about taking back control, I say, <laughs> well, why don't you start by finding out who owns half of London? Because we don't know. And they could be Mexican cartels, and they could be Russian gangsters, they could be uh, American tax evaders, they could be Chinese gambling consortia. We don't know. We are deep in this. And this has been going on for years and years. Hasn't years it? and years and years and years and years. As soon as, uh, as, soon as gangster capitalism emerged, Bierozowski and his people, they were smart. They knew what Russian history was like. This free-for-all that was going on in the 1990s wasn't going to last long. Some Stalinoid figure would come along and uh, want to control it for themselves. And there was a lot of dissatisfaction which Putin was able to, to build on. Life expectancy in Russia during the 1990s collapsed from the age of 69 to 58 for males. People were poor. Prices were going up. Putin was, you know, a no-brainer that someone like Putin was going to come along. And so Berezovsky, fully cognizant of Russian history and, uh, and other um, oligarchs, were uh, money was hemorrhaging out of Russia in the 1990s. And they, it was all going into safe havens, havens in, the, in the West because they knew that someone would come along and try and nick it from them at, at, at some point, just as they had nicked it from Russian state assets. But these unexplained wealth orders, which are said to partly be inspired by the shame the mafia of law. mafia on TV. <laughs> yes, and they said that prompted the government. They thought, well, this is embarrassing. We better do something at last. But do you think they, that would work, or do you think governments... Well, can't so quite... far, I think we've had three <coughs> unexplained wealth orders. Um, uh, one is an important one against an uh, Azeri, an Azerbaijani. Um, which I, I'm keeping tracks with. But uh, what law enforcement is, is suggesting to me, leastways, is, is that at the moment they don't have the resources and there doesn't appear to be much appetite. Uh, uh, perhaps more important at the moment, I, I think un unexplained wealth orders could become an extremely important tool sure. in, the, in the right hands. I think that Theresa May belatedly today has said that they're going to increase stamp duty for uh, um, non-residents buying property in London, which is welcome. How much it'll, it'll put them off, how much they'll be put off by Brexit, uh, I don't know. But if you take somewhere like Copenhagen, for example, in Copenhagen, you cannot buy a property until you have been a proven resident for five years in Denmark. Um, that's the kind of system right. we really need to have in the United Kingdom. But uh, uh, Theresa May's gesture today certainly is a, 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 a wee step in the right, the right direction. So um, uh, the other thing she's done, of course, is, is she refused to renew uh, Abramovich's uh, work visa. Um, and... Uh, I thought that was a slightly risky thing to do. The Russian community in London, partly, I regret to say, because of McMafia, the Russian community in London is not feeling terribly secure at the moment. And there are a lot of Russians in London who have nothing to do with the modern stuff like, stuff like that. The problem for the British government, if it goes down the road of saying, right, Abramovich, you're not coming in. He is the most important Russian in London is you see other communities saying, wait a minute, that means that if the British government has a spat with another government, then it's the communities inside London who are getting it in the neck, which is why I think unexplained wealth orders are much more important, because what you're doing is you're looking at the institutional systemic nature of the problem and not individuals, although Theresa May did get a boost when the Swiss... Uh, decided to turn down Abramovich's um, request for residency there because of uh, alleged suspicions of um, uh, various types of malfeasance. Sure, OK. Um, well, that's fantastic. It's all very interesting stuff. And it's now time for some questions, probably, if anybody... 
This lady here. Dobrý den, Miša. Dobrý Já den. jsem Češka, ale budu mluvit anglicky. Já budu mluvit anglicky. To je dobrý. My question is in two parts. If you had a crystal ball, what do you think it would show you? And the second part is, would you dare look into it? <laughs> <laughs> so, I have to say that my overriding concern about the world is climate change. Um, but I also believe that climate change is, uh, is driven in part by the accelerating inequality in wealth uh, across the world, both within countries and be between countries. Uh, however, so looking at the crystal ball and seeing that as my, uh, as my great fear, I have to say that it is not all hopeless. We are seeing around the world significant movements of people who are saying that uh, this grand um, apparatus of malfeasance around the world, enough is enough. So we have, um, uh, for example, we now have a move in South Africa to really uncover what was going on between the Guptas and Jacob Zuma, the state capture and the looting of uh, South African assets. In Brazil, we are seeing it's, it's very complicated what's going on in Brazil, um, but we are seeing a movement for the first time to imprison politicians and uh, business people for grand corruption, I mean corruption on an unimaginable scale, um, and whilst the pr imprisonment of Lula is very problematic from, from a, a lot of perspectives. He's not the only person who's been imprisoned. One of the richest and most influential oligarchs in Brazil, indeed, uh, in the world, who was head of uh, the, uh, the biggest construction company in, in Brazil, was sentenced to 20 years, uh, just under 20 years uh, in jail three years ago. Um, we... You have never seen anything like that in Brazil at all, where the elite since colonial times has uh, enjoyed complete impunity um, from prosecution for a whole variety of crimes. We are seeing the Department of Justice using the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act to go after bad people. Even in the United Kingdom, occasionally the Bribery Act is, is used uh, for companies... Uh, uh, Shell at the moment and any the Italian, uh, the Italian uh, oil giant are being prosecuted for bribery and corruption in uh, in Nigeria. We have organisations like Global Witness and Transparency International, which are um, researching all of this and helping to change legislation. There is a real fight going on between people who want to stand up for decency and say corruption, political corruption and organized crime is not uh, reflect, uh, a reflection of our values. And there is a real, there's a real struggle going on now. Trump's uh, position um, is really central to this, even though it's also um, uh, part of a wider cultural war in the United States. It will have a real political and economic impact both in America and around the rest of the world. So I would say that whilst I think the, fright, the, the, the future is very, very frightening and I'm not terribly optimistic, I think we all need to go down fighting and uh, for standing up for decent, decent values. Well, almost a positive beings. note there. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else? This lady here in the red. Thank you. Hello. Um, Could you say your name? Sorry, it's, li li it's Linda. Okay. Um, I'm sure you know the work of Roberto Saviano, who in investigates and writes about the mafia in Italy. He spends his life uh, moving every two days because of the threat to his life. And I'm just wondering how you've managed to avoid a similar situation. <laughs> so, I, in 2009, I was invited to the Conference of Internazionale in Ferrara, in Italy. And uh, I was invited to share the stage with Roberto Saviano. 
And uh, it was then that I understood what it's like being a backing singer for the Rolling Stones. <laughs> uh, in the wonderful municipal, municipal theater in, in Ferrara, he walked onto stage and the entire theater erupted, <laughs> as did all the cinemas where it was being live streamed around Ferrara. People had been queuing for days to get tickets to see Saviano. And this man stood up and, and encompassed, a, a, he, he, he embodied the one thing which Italian had not, Italians had not had for years, and that was hope. Somebody who'd had the courage to stand up and name names when it came to the Camorra in Naples. And as you say, as a consequence, um, uh, his uh, mother and brother are in witness protection. He has seven uh, close protection officers of the Carabinieri with him at all, all times when he's in Italy and he has to change his apartment. His own father had to write an article, he's a doctor, write an article uh, renouncing him as his, his son under the threat of death from the, from the Camorra. And Roberto's become um, a good friend of mine uh, since then, is uh, a simply uh, unique beacon of courage, the like of which I have, I have rarely encountered, although I do know other people um, who are as courageous as, as he is, perhaps not quite so, so famous. What Roberto does and what I don't do is, is Roberto denounces people. Um, if he ran as a politician, I'm sure he would succeed. Uh, he would succeed, but he doesn't, he doesn't want to. He wants to be a writer. It's very difficult for him under the circumstances that, that he lives in. Uh, but he is threatened because he directly attacked the economic interests of the Camorra. What, what I do, and he and I have discussed the way that we, that we write and what we write about a, a lot, is I like to go and talk to people involved in organized crime. I like to understand what their motives are. And what I like to do is to just lay out to people in my writing how the world works. And then it's up to people to decide what is moral and what is, what is uh, immoral. Obviously, you know, when I'm talking to murderers and things like that, I, 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 there are, I have problems. I, am, I'm, I find that conflicting to, to some degree. But I think it's more important to be able to map what is happening. And so I think Roberto and I uh, are doing the same things, but we take different, different routes to, uh, uh, to get there. OK, great. We've probably got time for a couple more. Um, this lady here? Sorry. Michelle, hi. Um, I, um, there's been a, a very kind of cliched, stereotypical representation of women um, in organised crime, in classic literature, in classic film. I wonder what the reality is and how, um, how important their role is or not. Uh, they, in my experience, well, the, the, the area I can talk about best is Brazil because I did my last book was the biography of the guy who ran the largest uh, favela in, uh, in Rio for five years as head of the cocaine trade and therefore he was prime minister, head of the secret police, head of the police, everything for that favela, which is 100,000 100, people roughly. And I lived in the favela for uh, several months, and I spoke to uh, all, of, uh, all of the mothers of his children. There are, they are many and varied. Uh, <coughs> and essentially, women are, uh, if they're part of an organized crime family, their most common role is as victims, um, because uh, in somewhere like Brazil, there are very high levels of domestic violence, particularly in the favelas. And most common of all is um, uh, women being impregnated, having children, and then the uh, father uh, either disappears or gets killed or gets uh, imprisoned. So the, the function of women in an organized crime structure that exists in a favela is essentially to keep uh, social relations alive and working while uh, the men are off drug dealing or shooting each other or spending time in, spending time in prison. Um, 
uh, Claire Longridge's done some very good investigation into uh, uh, women in organized crime in, uh, in Italy. But in my experience, I mean, when it came to doing I, my, the book I wrote after McMafia, Dark Market, was about uh, cybercrime and it was about hackers. And I interviewed hackers around the world. There you get to a stage where it's about 96% of people involved in cyber criminal activity are men. The gender balance is just extraordinary. Just as it's a similar ratio to the, uh, the people who actually run the internet physically around the world. Mm. They're all men. Uh, for all of the sort of you know, touchy-feely, we're entering a new age in new technology. It is an extremely gender-skewed gender world. And um, so is cybersecurity, and so is the world of, uh, of, of hackers. And I, I have come to the conclusion, having worked on the subject for about 15 to 20 years, that basically crime tends to be driven. I write about crime incidentally because it's about politics and it's about social issues, not because it's you know, intrinsically it's exciting, although that, that is a part of it, I suppose. But I have come to the conclusion that crime is basically driven by men. Mm. I think women are okay with that, probably. But, um, <laughs> should we have one more? One more question, maybe? Does anyone else want to? Well, I can tell you as a retired teacher, when I saw children in the playground, the boys often picked up a stick, and guess what they turned it into? And the girls would pick up a stick and turn it into a wand. <laughs> All well, too often. Well, I think oh, on that are. note... Yes, quite. Um, Two things. Um, Misha is going to go into the John Sando bookshop now and sign his brilliant book, which I think everybody must read if they want to understand the world at all. Um, and could everybody please go out by this exit, not the one they came in? And, oh, nope. sorry. Forget that. Uh, the, that the exit, exit at the back. And thank you so much, Misha. Thank you. Fantastic. Fantastic.